Hey everybody, welcome back to Digital Charcuterie. It's me, your old bald friend, Andrew Fantasia. Welcome back uh, to another very exciting Marvel United Deep Dive. Here's how these work. If you, this is your first one, welcome. Uh, I'm going to be taking a look at all of the Marvel United boxes I own in depth, super in depth. We're going to go over them together and hopefully it'll give you an idea of every little bit of minutia inside every box and help you make a purchasing decision because maybe you don't have all the Marvel Uniteds and you want to jump on the bandwagon, but you don't know where to throw your dollars. Well, hopefully these will help. And today we're going to talk about some Norse gods, but first wizards. That's right. We were wizards is the name of the book series that I wrote and self-published and you can get on Amazon right now. I'm going to put a link in the description below to where you can find these. They are my pride and joy, my fantasy saga that I've been working on for many, many years and I'll probably be working on for the rest of my life, but say la vie. They have wizards, they have adventure, they have fun, they have magic, they have monsters, they have all kinds of classic just fantasy goodness tucked into two little thin bricks of fiction. So what are you waiting for? Go pick up We Were Wizards right now on Amazon, link below. I wanna make a quick correction before we begin. Uh, thank you to the person in the comments who called me out on this because guess what? I ain't good at math. Uh, and I made a big mistake in the very first deep dive video when I was assigning worthiness points to the original core box. I gave it 29 points. However, I forgot to add one extra point for the core box essentials. I think I forgot to tally that in. So the grand total of that box should be 30 points, not 29. And from this moment forward in the deep dives, uh, when we start ranking and, and comparing everything together, you'll see the core box will now have 30 points. So thank you for correcting me. And let's move on to hopefully some better addition skills in the future. Now it's time to hit the table and see what we can make of Marvel United Tales of Asgard. So put on your winged helmet, grab a flagon of mead, whatever those are, and join me at the table. Here it is. Here's Tales of Asgard with this gorgeous uh, Technicolor Ragnarok color scheme, which also makes it look like a fruit by the foot. Or no, not a fruit by the foot. Fruit roll-up. I always get those two mixed up. You guys remember fruit roll-ups? That's how they looked. Uh, the sort of gradient color scheme. So this is Tales of Asgard, and it's purdy and it's shiny, and it's a very lovely expansion, particularly for those who owned the core box and thought, well, I have almost every major Avenger, but there's a couple missing ones, including a very important one. They, they split up the Avengers through multiple boxes, and if you wanted to get them all, you had to pony up for some expansions. So this is Tales of Asgard. We're going to take a quick peek at the back before we open it up, and that is what's going to come inside. Now I should preface this by letting everybody know uh, if you plan on buying this and you don't have it already, there's one character in here, this guy right here, Beta Ray Bill, who is a Kickstarter exclusive character. You only got Beta Ray Bill if you backed the game on Kickstarter. So if you purchase this from a retail store um, right off the shelf, unless you were lucky enough that that store had a Kickstarter copy lying around for a while, you're going to get a box that doesn't have Beta Ray Bill in it. That's just the unfortunate reality of these kinds of things. So if you pick up a box of Tales of Asgard and you open it and there's no Beta Ray Bill, please don't be shocked or surprised or hurt. Please don't feel like you got scammed. You didn't. That's just the retail copy. So let's open the Tales of Asgard. And as always, we have a lovely rules leaflet welcome to asgard and in our tradition here so far on these deep dives we're gonna do the old andrew fantasia thing of reading the instruction manuals or at least the colorful blurb on the instruction manuals here we go the realm eternal stands as a bastion of justice throughout the cosmos only loki the god of mischief dares threaten asgard's peace with his obsession for usurping the throne Loki's minions, all traitors and henchmen mired in his tricks and illusions, work both secretly and openly to execute his master plan. It's up to Thor, Valkyrie, Korg, and Beta Ray Bill to untangle the web of intrigue and bring Loki to justice. 
Trouble is, even knowing Loki's ultimate goal, one can never be certain what traps the trickster god has laid for the heroes pledged to thwart his claim to rule. Fortunately, the trio are not without their allies, Asgard being home to many of the universe's most powerful individuals. But can they all be trusted? Uh -oh. Loki's insidious illusions play upon the hearts and minds, needs and desires, and no one, not even the mighty Thor himself, can wholly guard against his influence. Why, even one of the renowned trio might be unwittingly in Loki's employ. It's a race against time and hidden fears as this tale of Asgard unfolds. That's interesting, because it says renowned trio um, in reference to the three heroes, but the box also comes with the fourth exclusive hero, Beta Ray Bill, who was mentioned here. So it's like they they brought him up here and then they forgot in here to sort of edit it. So this paragraph talks as if you got the Kickstarter box and this paragraph talks as if you just got the retail box. That's kind of neat that that happened. I guess uh, they missed that in the proofreading, but that's okay. And there's the back with our nice little rule sheet that also clarifies what the alone rule means, which I actually forgot. Uh, alone means just a hero alone, uh, but if they're with the villain, it's still considered being alone. That's the thing I forgot. I thought if you were in the same spot as the villain, you are no longer considered alone, but that is not the case. All right, so taking a look inside, we've got this little plastic doohickey we'll put out of the way, and here is the content of the Tales of Asgard box, starting with our lovely locations. As we flip that over, we have the throne room. And if you look real close, you can see the ravens, uh, Odin's ravens, who have names, and I forget what they're called, but they're going, Kaka! See that? Isn't that clever? Lots of details if you really zoom in on a lot of these locations. Valhalla, very cool. And man, that is a great end of turn effect that Valhalla has. Bifrost Bridge, one of my favorite locations. Just the idea of a giant bridge made out of a rainbow. Come on. Come on. Like, that's... What, what are we doing with our life where we have stories that don't have rainbow bridges in them? We failed. <laughs> Asgardian Palace. Very nice. Heimdall's Observatory. Looking almost exactly like it does in the Thor movies. Because as we brought up, the Season 1 Marvel United campaign was very much inspired and designed to replicate the MCU. And Odin's Vault with some treasures, right? That's the last one, yeah. With some treasures in it, uh, most of which I cannot name. There's the Cosmic Cube. That's the Eye of Agamotto. This is just a green thing. I have no idea what it is. This looks like a box. Who knows? That looks like it could be Surtur's Crown or something. I don't know. I don't know the, the ins and outs of what Odin collects, but... That's pretty neat. And then underneath, we've got the dashboard for the one and only villain in this box, Mr. Loki. Does he have any special setup rules? He does not. Whoops, almost dropped Loki. No special setup rules. And uh, the season one villains, I should mention, this was before they came up with the supervillain mode, which was a season two thing. So these early season one villain dashboards don't have the setup for a supervillain mode. But if you get the cardboard villain dashboards, it'll show all of that, so you'll be covered. Uh, I've still never played supervillain mode. One of these days I will, but whenever my friends come over, we always just kind of want to work together. Loki is one of the simplest villains in all of Marvel United, so much so, in fact, that just the other day, Andrea Kiervesio was asked on the Facebook uh, group if there's any villains from season one he would want to revisit and maybe tweak and he did say that he always wanted to make Loki a little bit more complex and challenging. So I uh, I wonder if we'll ever see the day where we get different versions of uh, these season one villains. Personally, I would rather just get new villains that we don't have yet. And I think Loki is fine as it is. He is one of the simplest, one of the easiest. He's a very simple villain to face, but that's okay. They don't all have to be Green Goblin. And here are our Inner workings, all of our cards, all of our minis. All right, let's start. Uh, let's start from the left and work our way. So here we have Thor's deck and Beta Ray Bills. And they're very nice. Beta Ray Bill has Stormbreaker, which is colored gold in these things, which I think is awesome that it looks substantially different from Mjolnir. And I always thought Beta Ray Bill was a cool character. He's a big, scary-looking horseman, but he's a hero. Uh, and they have yet to put him in a movie, 
So I hope they put him in soon because I want to see Beta Ray Bill. And there's Thor with Mjolnir. His Mjolnir cards are really fun as well. And I'll tell you, after about, I want to say it was about five months. No, it was longer than five months. It was almost a year of owning just the initial core box. It was really nice finally getting all these expansions later and having Thor, uh, you know, having that missing Avenger join the roster. Because you really felt his absence. He's a, he's a big deal. More so than Hawkeye. Sorry, Hawkeye, but that's just the way it rolls. And then here we have Valkyrie, one of my biggest crushes in the MCU. I love Tessa Thompson. And Mr. Korg. And as we flip it over, we have Korg's deck right here, as well as Valkyrie's. And once again, the color choices that they make on these cards are exquisite. Like, look how beautiful that is. Uh, her sword is aqua, for crying out loud. Like, how can we not have more colored swords in things? Like, is Star Wars really the only thing that's going to let us have colored swords for the rest of our lives? Like, let's... Let's get on that, man. Fantasy people, where are you? That's why my fantasy books, I try to make them as colorful and uh, visually striking as I possibly can when it's just text on a page, right? So that my readers have something really eye-catching to envision. Uh, I don't know. If I knew how to do uh, Photoshop, I would make it all as a CG movie, but I cannot. So those are their cards right there. And underneath there, you can see we have these tokens here. They're all the same. They are called mistrust tokens and those are for the challenge of this box which i will get to in a minute but it's just a suspicious looking eye kind of like the illuminati logo and then here are the villain cards for our buddy loki and very much an mcu loki with the scepter and the way the costume looks here are his cards he's a trickster he's got some frost giant uh henchmen which i think is pretty fun Frost giants are cool, right? Why be just the giant when you can be a frost giant? And his deck really makes you feel like you're facing Loki with the way he spreads discord and the illusions that he casts and everything. They, Despite Andrea saying he wants to revisit the character or that he would like to have done the character differently, I think they nailed the essence of Loki. Did I already go through his whole deck? That did not feel like 12 cards. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, that's it. That's Loki, baby. Okay. And then underneath all of that were these cards here for this box's challenge, and that would be the Traitor Challenge. So the Traitor Challenge uh, introduces a hidden traitor mechanic into a co-op game, um, and it involves those mistrust tokens with the eyes on them. So when you're setting up, every player will get one wild token and every player will get one mistrust token as well as one allegiance card, which are these back here. You have these allegiance cards, right? So you would shuffle them up at the beginning of the game and he would hand them out to everybody. There's only four because usually you can only play with four. At least that's how season one was. And uh, as you flip these around, you would hand these out and you would everybody would secretly look at theirs and it might say that you're loyal, which makes sense because you're a loyal hero loyal to the cause, but one person has this card. Ooh, the traitor. And the traitor is secretly working against all the other heroes, as it spells out here. Once two missions are completed, players guess who they think the traitor is. If they're correct, they gain a wild token. However, any loyal heroes still with this mistrust token are KO'd. It doesn't spell out all the rules here. There's more detailed rules here. So essentially the mistrust tokens are bad and you want to get rid of them. On your turn, a player can choose to play their hero card face down, which sucks, but by doing that they can get rid of their mistrust token. Otherwise, once those two first missions are complete and you still have a mistrust token, you are getting KO'd. And one kind of neat thing is that if the trader is guessed, then from that point on they dump their hero deck and they play as the villain instead. So I'm not going to lie, it is definitely my least favorite challenge from season one and maybe from all seasons. I don't know. It It's interesting in theory, and it fits the theme of Loki, obviously. But the idea of having a hidden traitor and then 
that traitor just kind of stops playing and starts playing as the villain. It's uh, it's kind of a precursor to the supervillain mode. And I think supervillain mode is much more interesting. This just kind of adds a step in between that's not the most necessary and not the most interesting either. And I've never really liked the idea of hidden traitor board games. Personally, that's just because I'm a big solo gamer which means I can never do that. I've learned to play a lot of things solo. Monopoly, Clue, I can play a lot of things solo, even though they're not fun solo. But you really can't play a, a hidden trader game solo. It's just not in the cards, pardon the pun. Uh, so it's definitely not one that I have ever used. Probably not one I would ever plan to use, though I still do want to create a challenge deck and uh, have that be a thing that I can go to every once in a while. But yeah, the hidden trader thing, not my favorite. Uh, and then now we can jump to the minis. So we're gonna start with my least favorite mini in the box, and that is going to be Mr. Korg, uh, who is not only, he's not only my least favorite mini in the box, but I think it's safe to say he's one of my least favorite Marvel United heroes. Uh, and it's just because I'm not a huge fan of his deck. It's incredibly punch heavy. Uh, kind of like Hulk's, uh, except I just think Hulk is a cooler character than Korg. Uh, so I have more fun when I draw the Hulk than when I draw Korg. Korg, to me, just kind of seems uh, a little blah in this game. But he's still funny. He's very funny in the films, and his voice makes me laugh. So I'm never unhappy when I draw him, but he's definitely the one I'm least excited to draw when his name comes up. Um, I think we will next go with Mr. Thor, because this is just a very basic, fine and dandy, uh, classic pose and version of Thor. Of course, having Mjolnir there is essential. If he wasn't holding Mjolnir, I think there would have been torches and pitchforks outside of the Simon compound, but he looks great. Those long flowing locks, that classic helmet. This is a perfect classic Thor. Next, we'll go with Valkyrie, my next favorite mini. Uh, she has her sword pointed out here, her aqua sword. We've got her long braid back there. It's just kind of flowing. Whoops. There we go. It's just kind of flowing from the back of her hair. And she's even got the little facial tattoos looking very, very snazzy and very intimidating. Valkyrie's cool. And I know a lot of people were unhappy that this was the movie Valkyrie, the Tessa Thompson Valkyrie, uh, and not the comic Valkyrie, who looks significantly different. But eh, as far as I'm concerned, this one is awesome. I, I think she's one of the coolest looking characters in that movie. And I am happy with this. I will never complain to have anything or anyone who looks like Tessa Thompson, right? That's, that's You're never going to get a complaint out of me for that. And here's Mr. Beta Ray Bill, who was uh, introduced to me by all the trading cards I used to get as a kid. So I find this guy really fun, and I've known about him for a long time. Still hoping to see him in live action someday. And man, what a dynamic, just cool pose for a miniature. And he wears a very similar costume to Thor. And there's another character who dresses just like Thor and even looks like Thor. He's just like a blonde human looking dude whose name is Thunderstrike. And I think he was just a normal earth man who became worthy of Mjolnir, uh, I think anyway. He's another interesting character that I wonder if we'll ever see in this game or in a film one day. And then we will cap it off with my favorite mini who happens to be the one villain and that is Mr. Loki. And he's my favorite just because of, I mean, the, the horns, right? That Those helmets that the Asgardians wear are so elaborate. The scepter is pitch perfect from how it was in the movie. And also, I love that he is... It's kind of subtle and hard to see, but he is holding his cape. Yeah, there. That's a better angle on it. He's just holding his cape off the ground as if he's saying, I will not sully my fine cape on this pathetic mortal soil because that's how Loki rolls. He's very, very stuck up. Like, what a great little way to just indicate what kind of character he is via body language. That's something they teach us in acting school, 
Uh, how can you convey who and what a character is without saying anything? And I mean, this speaks volumes, right? Just that that action of, oh, I shall not sully my cape here. That tells us so much about this dude. So that's the box. Loki's definitely my favorite mini. Korg is definitely my least favorite mini and my least favorite hero deck. But to each their own, you might end up loving those characters. Now, once again, it's time to put everything back. Uh, and at the same time, if you've been keeping up by now, I'm going to add in the things that I keep in this box that don't come in the box. So what you've seen so far is everything that comes in the box. Now I'll be adding things that I store in here from other expansions. So I've got the Mjolnir and Stormbreaker equipment cards, which have a perfect little slot for them right down here. These slots are so perfect that if other Marvel United players don't keep their equipment in there, at least the ones who still have the boxes, then I'm baffled because it's like, it's made for it. If you're not keeping it there, where are you keeping it? So if you're one of the people who has these boxes, but you don't keep equipment in there, tell me in the comments where you do keep it, because I'm really curious. And I also keep Kid Loki in here, a hero from season three, because there was so much room in these wells that and I needed to free up a ton of space in the multiverse stretch goal box. So Kid Loki goes right in there. And then I have the villain decks for Gore and Hela, and I'm just going to pop those in there as well. Maybe one day we'll get Malekith. I don't know if there's room for Malekith in here, but I'll do my best. And then I'll put Hela and Gore's uh, villain dashboards in here too. I love how all three of the Thor villains here have four letter names. And there we have it. All right, now let's tally up all the points of worthiness in this beautiful, colorful box and see what score we can give to Tales of Asgard. Starting us off, you have five minis in this box. So that right there is worth one, two, three, four, five points. Four heroes, which gives us four points. It comes with one villain, Loki, who was worth two points. It comes with six locations, which is worth another lovely three points. And finally, you have the Secret Traitor Challenge, which is worth one extra point, bringing the grand total up to 15 points. So not too bad. Definitely not the most bang for your buck where Marvel United is concerned, but can't complain. You've got some great mainstay characters. I mean, Thor and Loki alone, that's, that's a lot of value in this box of just characters that everybody knows and loves. And there's a lot of good Asgard locations too that do a lot of cool things, particularly Valhalla. I like Valhalla a lot. Well, there you have it, the Tales of Asgard deep dive. I hope it helped you out somewhat. I will see you here again in about a week or so to talk about the next box. Here's a spoilery hint. Psst, psst, psst. It has to do with eight-legged arachnids. Oh, I didn't even know that was a thing that could happen when I did that. I apologize. <laughs> wow computers. Anyway, that'll do it for me here on Digital Charcuterie. Thank you so much for tuning in as we continue to make the wait for DC Superheroes United a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. See you next time.